the time period of Joshua is the dates are going to be between 1405 B.C. and 1385 B.C. For, for those who are keeping track, this is the time of Amenhotep III. Uh, Joshua, of course, means Yah is salvation. Jehovah is my salvation. Um, uh, he is the son of a fellow by the name of Nun, who is an uh, Ephraimite in Numbers 13.8. He, you know about him because of the seven times we looked at together already. We also can say that, um, that the book apparently in Joshua 24, 26 is his writing. Now, it appears as though the book comes in two forms. Joshua 24, 26 suggests that, jo that Joshua wrote the book even the last portion, but that presupposes the current form of the book, and I wouldn't do that. I'll tell you why. Because there's a common phrase you'll find in places like this, chapter 4, verse 9, or if you forget that one, chapter 5, verse 9, where it will say, until this day. It is called that until this day, which means to me there appears to be a second hand in the book that Joshua wrote it, and then its final form is perhaps put together, I'm going to suggest, by Samuel. I believe Samuel's the one who actually puts it in the form that you have now. And the reason I believe that is because if you look very carefully at the, um, the book of Joshua, for instance, if you go to, say, Joshua 15.63, in Joshua 15.63, the Jebusites still control the place that David takes in 2 Samuel 5 and makes Jerusalem. It is still called Jebus, okay? So whoever collected the final part of the book did it before David took over Jerusalem. I know that he, whoever did this in um, Joshua 16.10, it says that in the city of Gezer are the Canaan or the Canaanites, and they're still there. Well, we know that in 970 B.C., that the Can Canaanites were kicked out of that place and that Judah took over Gezer. But the thing is, it hadn't happened yet. Otherwise, it would say, it used to be like that and now it's this until this day. So it seems to me the right person to put here is probably Samuel. If it's not Samuel, it may be Gad or Nathan because Samuel, Gad, and Nathan put together the book of Samuel. I think that they deliberately were putting together at the time of the United Kingdom, Saul, David, and Solomon. They were actually literally taking the records of what Moses had given them, what Joshua had given them, what Job and Ruth were, and put them together and turned them into much what you see now. Again, I can't prove that. I can just tell you that it seems to fit the narrative. Is Joshua important to the New Testament? It is. You will find that when Stephen is preaching in Acts chapter 7, he mentions Joshua as though he's a real person and as though the events that occurred were historical. Hebrews 4, uh, three times mentions Joshua. Hebrews 11 is a Jericho reference and is about, in this case, Rahab. And my point is that the events in the book of Joshua are treated in the New Testament as though they're actual events. So let's dismiss the idea that it's some kind of allegory. That's not how the biblical people handled it. We do know that Joshua was, was commissioned to be the successor to Moses, and we saw that in Deuteronomy 31 to 34. We also know that God appeared to Joshua in Deuteronomy 34, 8. So that uh, three times in Joshua 1, God will say the same thing. Be strong and be courageous. Be strong and be courageous. Be strong and be courageous. That tells me two things. Joshua was not naturally as strong and courageous as we would like to think. The action figure is probably bulkier and more confident looking than the guy really was. But it also tells me this. He's obedient to God, and he accomplishes a great deal. Now, the book itself is divided into five boxes. I, I think there are four primary boxes, and then an, uh, an end with three burials. Entering Canaan, conquering Canaan, dividing Canaan, Canaan, settling Canaan. And then you end up with the story of the three burials, which is Joshua, who's 110 years old at the end of the story. Eleazar, which is the son of Aaron, meaning it's the end of another generation after Moses and Aaron. And the bones of Joseph. So we'll call it Joe's bones. That's not a um, uh, rib joint. Um, 
so what we have is the preparation stages that are happening to enter Canaan. We left off with Moses parked on Mount Nebo, turning over in Deuteronomy 34 after viewing the promised land, the mantle of leadership to the young 80-year-old whippersnapper named Josh, who would take over from that point. There was a battle over the body of Moses, you may remember, but that's a distraction from the, um, the movement of the people of Israel. They are overlooking the promised land and they're moving into the promised land. So they're gonna enter the promised land and it's going to be largely the Jericho story will, will take place here. Then they're gonna conquer the land by dividing it with in chapters six through nine, the center of the country. They go right across the center. Then they go south, then they go north and they divide the country up and cut it in half. And then there's a summary that happens in chapter 11 through chapter 12 that summarizes all that God had done. In doing this, they're gonna get tricked and duped and have to fight their way out of some situations that happen. It's not all rosy in the first half of the book. But what I want you to see is, once they start to subdue the land, they begin to divide the land into all of the, the um, tribes as God had already told them. Remember that was done already in numbers. They already knew where they were supposed to divide up. But there were some challenges they had to take on and some land inheritance issues as they divided up the land. And then they had some special cities that they had to designate as cities of refuge and whatnot. And those will be specified. And as they settle the land, there's a couple of items that will come up. More misunderstandings will come up and some final challenges before Joshua finally retires from the job. And we end up with the three burials at the back end of chapter 24. It's primarily right here. This is just the last few verses and how it wraps up the book. So the book of Joshua goes from the death of Moses to the death of Joshua. It is that generation. This is the generation, the children that left Egypt but were born in the desert enter here. They are not the people that left Egypt. They have never been slaves in Egypt. They are children of people largely born in the wilderness and that is their generation. Now, when you walk in, chapter one opens up with a lesson in the first nine verses. I need someone to read nice and loud the first nine verses so we can set up lesson number one. Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of David. Moses' his servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea towards the setting of the sun will be your territory. No man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Okay, what you actually are looking at is the commission of Joshua that is subsequent to the one we saw at the end of Deuteronomy. This is God looking at him saying it's time to step up. If I have two words for the whole thing, it's step up. Now, step back and look at, the, at what God's call to step up looks like. And what you'll see is that there are steps in this. First, very first verse, know that it is your turn. It's your time. So God calls, and the call of God is, it's, it's your turn. Second, in verse 2, the basis of your turn is my call. It's not because you're the right age. You're 80. Most of the people you're leading are 40. But guess what? You're tagged. You're it. I called. So the basis of the whole call is that I have spoken. And he says, I'm bringing them to the land. I'm giving them the land. Let me say it this way. Your call to do what God told you to do isn't about you doing anything. It's about God doing through you everything. Okay? Then you go to verse 3 and 4, 
and you stand on God's promises. Every place on which your soul treads, I have given it to you. <laughs> well, that's because I said so, just as I spoke to Moses. So look for God's promises and stand on God's promises. And he says, I don't care if it's the wilderness or Lebanon, every direction, everything that has happened, I make the promises, you fulfill uh, what I call you to do. Now, go down to verse 5. It's interesting because you, you don't base... You, you do what you do based on God's presence and God's power, not just based on the need. Everybody else understood there was a need that day too, but Joshua was the one who was empowered to do it. It says, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I've been with Moses, I will be with you. I want you to underline, I will be with you. The central promise of the empowering is the presence of God. Do not misunderstand that your power to execute what God has given you to do is linked to his presence. He will be with him. That is, walk with God and you'll be empowered by God. Don't walk with God and don't expect God's power to work in you and through you. Now verse 7. We have to concentrate on faithfulness one step at a time. Look at verse 7. Be strong, be courageous, be careful to do according to the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Then he goes right down to the detail. Don't go left. No, 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 no. Don't go right. Stay exactly on the path of where I put you. In other words, you, con you concentrate on your faithfulness one step at a time. Don't look down the road at the many miles ahead. Look at the next step and walk with me. Next step, walk with me. Next step, walk with me. Remember what I said earlier in the year? The big decisions are the small decisions. It's not that you don't, you know, you kind of kind of walk with God somewhat haphazardly and then you really trust him for your career or your spouse. You're not even in the right uh, room for the right selections if you haven't taken each step carefully. Step by step, I would say, is very, very important. And I think the end of verse 7 makes that point. I would also say in verse 8, what's at the center of everything that's going on in your heart? What's going on in your thinking? What, do you, what kind of thinking do you have in verse 8? I want, you, I want you reciting and thinking about the law. M the word meditate, see that word meditate in verse 8? If you take a ping pong ball and put it in a box, and there's nothing else in the box, and you close the box and tape up the box and shake the box, the ping pong ball goes like this all over the inside of the box, that's the word meditate. It's the word to touch it from every side, to see it from every direction. He said, what I want you to do is go out there and march with my army, but don't think about army. Think about what I told you. I want your, my word to be washing over your mind constantly. Some of you like worship type music. I would, I would encourage you, if you want to do yourself an enormous favor, get some of your music repertoire to be nothing more than scripture being sung. It will help you enormously. And what's amazing is if you struggle to memorize scripture, make it a song. I mean, seriously, there are people, I, I know people in this congregation that can barely talk, but they can remember 70 years ago a song they heard. Songs are easier to remember. So put the word of God at the center of your heart and bounce it around in every direction. Look, no matter what you're feeling, God says, Make what you're thinking what I have told you. In Romans 12, it'll be the transformation of your mind by the scripture. That's what happens, all right? In verse 9, I would tell you one last thing. Don't be shaken by the circumstances. Don't tremble or be dismayed. I'm with you wherever you go. Do not, do not tremble at the circumstances. Fear is a terrible motivator. Do not use fear. Okay, so does everybody see the first lesson? First lesson is real simple. I've called you, here's how I want you to go. Now the second lesson is 10 through 18. Somebody read that one. Then Joshua commanded the officers and the people saying, pass through the midst of the camp and command the people saying, prepare provisions for yourselves for within three days you are to cross this Jordan to go into the land which the Lord your God has given you to possess it. To the Reubenites and the Gadites and to the half tribe of Manasseh, Joshua said, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God gives you 
rest and will give you this land. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you beyond the Jordan. But you shall cross before the brothers in, in battle array all your valiant warriors and shall help them. Until the Lord gives your brothers rest as he gives you. And they also possess the land which the Lord your God has given you. Then you shall return to your own land and possess that which Moses the servant of the Lord gave you beyond the Jordan before the sunrise. They answered Joshua, saying, All that you have commanded us we will do, and wherever you will send us we will go. Just as we obeyed Moses in all the things, so we will obey you. Only may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your command is, does not obey your words, and all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and courageous. Okay, step back now, and if chapter 1, verses 1 through 9 was a personal call, chapter 1, verses 10 through 18 are some plans for the people and the call of the people to stand. And he gives a series of steps. I counted five of them here. And the first one in verse 10 was, get the people together. They're not able to do it alone. So um, he, he says, the first thing he wants to do is build a team. He says, I want the officers to come together. Joshua can't just issue orders and all the thousands do it. He needs a team. So start number one with a team. Second, so if one through nine gave Joshua his call, 10 gives the team their call, the officers, okay? Second, verse 11, let the people know the next step so they can start gearing up for the next step. So he says to them, pass through the midst of the camp, command the people, prepare provisions for yourselves. Three days from now, we're going to cross the Jordan. They need to know what's coming. Now, Joshua can't talk to them all, but Joshua can tell the officers, and the officers can talk to the people. So the team now becomes vocal spokesmen. We are moving in three days. Get ready. One of the big problems is that we, we sometimes get into ministry situations where we're anticipating that everybody else knows what we know or what direction we're trying to go. You have to say it, say it, say it, say it, because they don't catch it if you don't keep saying it. I would say a third thing is this. Make sure people understand loyalty to one another. Now, where do I get that? It says, to the Reubenites, Gadites, and half-tribe of Manasseh. Who are they? What's unique about those tribes, the two and a half tribes? They're on the other side of the, They're on the, other side of the Jordan. And the problem is this. It may seem obvious to them that they don't have to serve because you're going now past where they're going. They don't live on, they're not trying to live in the West Bank. They live on the East Bank of the Jordan. Why should they go? So he says, I need you to understand loyalty. And he, and he makes it very clear that when you go, I want you to base everything on God's revered word, everything that he has already said in verses 13, 14, and 15. You remember what Moses and, uh, and God had arranged with you. You're going to go, you're going to leave your kids here and whatever, and you're going to go and you're going to stay and you're going to fight. But you have to be clear about what the team looks like, what one anothering looks like on the team. And look at it down to verses 14 and 15. You have to be clear about what the end goal is. When do they get to say, we're done? When is, when is the um, tribe of Reuben, Ephraim, uh, I'm sorry, Reuben, uh, Gad, and, and uh, Manasseh, when are they done their work? Yeah, when your brothers possess the land, then you can come home. You can come back over here and, and, and milk your own cows and whatever. Right now, you can have this land and you don't have to go over with them, but the army has to go with them. That means all of you men are going. And, that, and you can make all the camps you want over here, but you've got to help them until they win, then you can come back. Now, what's interesting is that's going to cause its own problem. It's interesting that God gave the Jewish people a land cut right in the center with a deep crack so that the... the tests of loyalty would be two sides of that crack, okay? And, and, and here's what it says. It says in verse 16, expect the people to actually agree. You don't just give commands. You make the people say they agree, okay? And when they agree, then in verses 17 and 18, you make sure they understand who's leading what. What are the leadership lines here? So just as you obeyed Moses, so we will obey you. We saw in the past that we, when those who did not obey Moses were, you know, swallowed up by the desert, bad things happened, just as we obeyed Moses, so now we will obey you, Josh. You're the new man, and your team is the right team, and, uh, and, and as you move forward, we will follow you. There needs to be a public statement of who's in charge, 
And what's interesting is that chapter one then gives you the call of Joshua, then it gives you the call of the officers, then it gives you the call of the people, and it goes from the center outward. And really, that's how all, uh, all great things are planned. All right, now, if you go to chapter two, now we get into the story. And let's go to, can, can we all agree for a minute that Joshua is in many respects, like the book of Acts is in the New Testament? Up till now, Israel has been in the desert percolating as Israel and those who came to join Israel. For the first time now, the message that God is in heaven and he is keeping his um, promises to Abraham through Isaac through Jacob and we are his people, for the first time now in Joshua will be bumping into Canaanites, non-believers. The message is now going out. For the first time, it's going beyond the circle of, listen, for the last 40 years, the only people you saw were Jews or people who were attacking Jews. That's all you saw. Yeah, there was the occasional Egyptian, but by now they're all intermarried and they're all part of us. There's only one law between us, so it's all us. Now as we move in, now it's going to be us walking into the Canaanites. And for the first time, there's a, the, the, the first converts of Canaanites will come over to the, the side of Israel. What would be a name of an early convert, a convert? In the book of Joshua, what's an early convert to the other side? Who? What's that? Rahab. Rahab. Very good. She quits Canaan and joins Israel. But that's an early thing. And what's interesting about the early stories are, expect it like the book of Acts, where the person, the people who are inside the camp are sometimes doing wrong, like Achan, and the people who are outside the camp are actually helping God when they shouldn't be, right? The Canaanites should be bad, the Israelites should be good, but the story, first story out of the gate is a bad Israelite and a good Canaanite. Everybody's out of position. Now, get to the book of Acts. Expect that, that there's pressure on the outside, there's unbelieving Jews, and then there's the church and they're giving everything, and then you got Ananias and Sapphira, and you got bad Christians. And it's interesting how early on both of these stories will be very, very similar in some regard. Okay? You're going to have really great converts in the book of Acts and really bad Christians. The people who came up through the church should be the people that are doing the right thing. But no, it's going to be Cornelius who's going to come out being a good guy and Ananias and Sapphira who are going to go to the body bags. And it's a juxtaposition, okay? Let's pick up chapter 2. I'm trying to do this quick, and I need to do it quick, but pick up chapter 2. And um, let's go through, well, I'll tell you what. There's really not a way to do this and break it down. Go to the first 14 verses nice and loud, please. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men and a spy secretly to Shittim, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came into the house of a harlot whose name is Rahab and lodged there. It was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you who have entered your house, for they have come to search out the land. But the woman who had taken the two men and had hidden them, and she said, Yes, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. It came about when it was time to shut the gate at dark, the men went out, and I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof and hid them in the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order on the roof. So the men pursued them on the road to Jordan to the forts, and as soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, they shut the gate. Now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know the Lord has given you the land, and that the terror of you have fallen on us, that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard now the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, who were utterly destroyed. When we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven for the Lord, or above and on earth beneath. Now therefore, please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you will also deal kindly with my father's household. And give me a pledge of truth, and swear my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters, with all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. So the men said to her, Our life for yours, if you do not tell this business of ours. And it shall come about when the Lord gives us the land, that we will do kindly and faithfully with you. Now what's interesting is, the bulk of what you just heard was actually the testimony, the, the, uh, um, the news accounts from the Canaanite perspective. 
What you just heard was, this is the stuff we've been hearing, okay? Now, if I have a principle for chapter two, it's that God will give you hearts and souls of men and women that are outside the camp. He will give them to you, but there's a way you have to approach it. In taking the enemy, God will give you some into your hand. And here's, here's an interesting thing. Look at verse one and recognize the enemy and know where he is strong is the very first principle. It says, Joshua, son of Nun, sent two men as spies. Why? Because you cannot take on an enemy when you do not know where they are, how strong they are. You've got to have reconnaissance. So you recognize the, uh, the enemy for what they are and you go straight at it. This, and this is one of our problems in our country. We're not even allowed to figure out who the enemy is. When you can't identify the enemy, you can't fight. So Joshua gets it under control right away. The second thing I noticed in verse 1 is you never send them alone to deal with it. There's a partner that is sent along with them to do the reconnaissance. Why is that important? Because he needs to have two sets of eyes on the problem. It's dangerous to send reconnaissance and only get one person's perspective. How many of you have asked somebody's opinion and you got their opinion and you really took a lot of stock in their opinion, except for after a while you learned that their opinion wasn't the norm? That they had the wrong... I don't give movie endorsements. But how many of you have had somebody send you to... Oh, this is the funniest movie ever. And you got there and you thought, what were they thinking? This is terrible. And this is like two hours of my life I'll never get back. And I can't believe they just subjected me to this. One person's opinion may not be reliable. So you set another set of uh, eyes on it. I think it's interesting that... These first converts come with the first spies. And so as they go in, look at what it says. You have to find those who help you understand the enemy's ploy. You, ha you have to look for somebody who understands what's going on. And so they go, they view the land, especially Jericho. They went and they came to the house of a harlot. Now there's a difficulty with this term harlot because the exact same term in Hebrew is the word for innkeeper. You have to understand something about the time of the Bible. People had exterior walls around their cities. And when you, so if you built this, I'm going to, I'm going to fly over a biblical city, which you could not have done, right? But um, let's say that this is the top of the hill of a biblical city. And this is the rampart going out from it. And I'm looking down at it. So from the side, it would look like this. Okay, does that make sense? You're looking down. Here's my gate right here. Okay, this is the rampart or glossy that's around it. The, the walls in Jericho and in other places were built with outside walls and inside walls. And then they would have perpendicular walls in between them around the outside of the city. Most people didn't live inside the city. They lived out here in the surrounding area. The city was the place where they took all of their um, barley that they harvested and put it inside of a grain silo in the city. Inside the city would be stables. Um, inside the city would be a cultic area, a shrine. Um, inside the area would be the governor's palace or the king's palace. So you have an administrative center, you have a cultic center, you have a grain center, you, you have an economic <coughs> stable or storehouse. This, by the way, is a good look at what Megiddo looks like today. All right, inside the city, each of these perpendicular walls forms rooms inside the city. Biblically speaking, if you wanted to have an inn, you would have it here near the gate inside the wall, right? Then let's say people are coming and they're going to, we have a, a, an army marching. So we'll make a little army down here and put a bunch of little army guys. They look like ants, but a bunch of army guys are coming and they're marching on our city. What are we going to do? Well, all the people in the tents out here will, who live on the skirt of the woman who live in the outskirts of town, right, all come inside the city. And now they're hiding inside the city, and they'll fill up these, many of these areas 
with junk. They'll take all the stuff and packing from all of their uh, tents and all of the, any wood, anything they have, and stack it up inside the outside. These, these are offset inset walls. And then if a battering ram comes up and begins to hit at the wall, it'll crumble against a lot of stuff that's inside there, making it hard to just go piling in. The person who's, who has an area in between the two walls on the outside of the city is an innkeeper. It means person who keeps people overnight. Now, that same word later on becomes house of prostitution. Anybody have a hard time making the transposition with people who keep people overnight and people who keep people overnight, okay? So the point is that when you run into uh, when you run into Rahab, you need to be careful about not assuming she did the things that people say. The word harlot here actually is, um, is actually the only thing it says is that she was a woman who, who was a, a woman of the wall is essentially is what she was. Okay. Now, when you get to the Hebrews 11, it uses the Greek term for harlot. And so some people say, well, if Hebrews 11 says it, then it's the word of God. And so therefore she was. I don't know whether she was or wasn't. I'm just saying you can't make the assumption based on the innkeeper. This is a woman who takes people at night. There may be no hanky-panky going on at all, okay? So don't assume like the guys were like batting their eyelash at her and you know, I mean, just don't, don't be making more out of it than it is. Here's what I know. I know that she goes and in chapter two, it says that, that they went there and they found a helper. They found a woman. But does this woman sound like she's sleazy or does she sound like she's pretty, pretty on the uh, up and up? I mean, do you get the feeling when you listen to what she said that she's got, a she's got her head together? Okay, this is not some kind of flimsy person. This is a person of substance. What I'm interested in is if you look at verse 2, you have to remember that the enemy is watching all the forward movement you're doing. So it was told of the king of Jericho saying, behold, men of the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. So the enemy is always watching to see what's happening. And then you get to verse three and the king of Jericho sends word to, to Rahab. Now, I don't think that she sent word to Rahab uh, and everyone else in town, I think she sent word to the, to the people she thought would know because they're close to the gate and because of what they do, okay? So bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. Now, it's obvious to me that when you're looking at the text, um, don't, don't take for granted that God's going to somehow watch out for you. Don't take for granted that he's going to protect you. But know that he has put in motion in chapter one, if you follow me, I will protect you. I will give you uh, victory. And so here are the guys, they're just in there and, and the unbelievers are dealing with each other and it's this woman and her king and they're up there hiding under the flax. Go all the way down to verse eight for a second. Watch what God does to open the heart of the woman because the story isn't really about the hiding and the flax. It's about the woman and what's happening in her. She starts off away from God and ends up as part of God's people. And if you watch what happens in verse eight, it says, now before they lay down, she came up to them on the roof. And, and so it's, it's nightfall. They're gonna go to sleep. She comes up quietly, says to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land. What I think is interesting is how much she seems to be in, in tune with, I've been observing and um, there will be people in every field you go to that will be drawn to you. And I believe God will send ahead of you in any mission situation that you're in, that some people will be drawn in. On a foreign field, one of the things you need to do is look for somebody with spiritual sensitivity. We usually, this is our little symbol for spiritual sensitivity. You look, when you go out, some of you have done evangelism out on beaches. You look for somebody with spiritual sensitivity. Somebody who's been paying attention, somebody who thinks deeper than, I don't know, you know. And Rahab is the, is the right person to start with. Why? Because listen to the way she talks. She's, she, you can just hear it. I know the Lord has given you the land. Notice that right away there are God words in her speech. 
So right at the very outset, she's already saying, I see God doing something. And then it says that the terror of you has fallen on us, that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. I think that one of the things you should anticipate is that unbelievers around you are observing what is going on. They're not disconnected from truth. Many people, God is at work on convicting them already before you get there. This lady obviously is under the conviction of God and God is already speaking into her life. I think that also that they'll recognize God's work in and through you if you relay that. So verse 9, she sees it. Verse 10, we've heard, all heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea. I think what's great is that well past Israel is the fame of God already spreading. And so God is speaking to people who... Israel hasn't said anything. I also understand that they'll commit to follow him. You're secondary. Look at verse 11. Her primary goal isn't to follow them, it's to follow him. When we heard it, our hearts melted away. No courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. She's not saying, we are celebrating Israel. You Jews are like, you glow in the dark. I got to be a Jew. I'm telling you, you guys are the greatest thing since buttered bread. No, she's going, we've seen the power of your God. We see that, uh, we, I believe that God is at work. I believe it's bigger than you. One of the interesting things is that God opens up most of the testimony and the guys haven't said anything. All, for all I know, they're sitting on a pile of flax listening and that's their big witness. They didn't even give her a track or anything. They're just sitting there looking at her like, you know, Deer caught in a headlight as she's kind of going, please tell me, what must I do to be saved? Like she's coming all the way across. Now, verse, 11, verse 12. I also think it's is that they need to join our fellowship, even though they don't know much about how, um, how to live like us or how to live with us. Remember that when people first come, they don't know anything about what they're supposed to be. And so what you see in verse 12 is, Now therefore, please swear by me, by, uh, swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you. Look, I've been nice to you. Can you, can you at least agree that my father's household is going to have a pledge that we're not going to be hurt? You're going to spare my father, verse 13, and my mother, my brothers, my sisters. Here's the thing. They don't know when they come to Christ they don't know how they're supposed to act. What they know is they need a team. What they know is they want to be loved. What they know is they need to be accepted. And so at this point already, they don't know much, but they just know what they want. They want to be a part of whatever you're a part of. And what I think is interesting is in verse 14. The smart thing to do is show them openly that they are loved and that they're accepted before they even know the secret handshake of the, you know, whoo, you know, the little things we do. They don't know our lingo yet, <coughs> but already they know they want God and they want to be a part of us. Verse 14, the men said to her, our life for yours, if you do not tell this business of ours, and it shall come about when the Lord gives us the land that we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. I believe Rahab didn't simply lie to her king. I believe that she, in her understanding, made a life covenant, a blood covenant with them, that it's going to be her life for their life. So she was actually, it was all self-benefit. Stop right there and look at verse 14. People come to Christ for self-benefit. That's where they start. Don't expect them to have this great view of how they one day want to be in heaven because it blesses God and they want to sing in the hallelujah chorus. They're there to get saved. They're there to, to get the benefits of being a believer. You don't grow up until after you start. They're just getting started. She's already on the page of this is what I want to get from this. I believe she went in with a Canaanite mindset. I do this, you do that. Reci reciprocity. You re reciprocate for what I do for you. Bottom line is, when you pick up the story in 15 to 24, you find out that, that um, the first steps of identification are about protecting them as the battle ensues. So they, she let them down on a rope through the wall for her, for her house was on the city wall, underlined on the city wall. That's how I know what we're talking about here. So she was, uh, she was living on the wall. She said to them, 
Go to the hill country so that the pursuers will not happen upon you and hide yourself there for three days until the pursuers return. Then afterward you may go on your way. The men said, we shall be free from this oath to you which, we have made, uh, which you have made us swear unless when we come into the land you tie a cord of scarlet thread in the window. It, it's an interesting thing. Do you remember where else you saw a cord? Yes, yes, in Jacob and Esau. And it was, again, it's a, you see this first, this firstlings here? Well, here it is, the first person and the first household that's going to be saved out of, the, out of the converts of the country, right? But what's interesting is they said, look, you got to take this scarlet thread, put it in the window, um, which you let us down, and gather to yourself, into your house, your father, your mother, your brothers, and all your father's household. If everybody's not here, it's not our fault. If you don't have the cord, it's not our fault. So the conditions that are, they are given uh, are very, very clear. Listen, you, Rahab, need to do this, and your family needs to do this, or you're not protected. I think what's interesting is um, they gave her something to do right away. I think that's important. They let her be participant in what was going on. And they had to understand the small steps that they need to take in order to, 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 to realize the salvation that's about to be available to them. And so it says, um, verse 19, it shall come about that anyone who goes out of the doors of your house into the street, his blood will be on his own head. We take no responsibility for anybody who leaves the house. In the house, only in the house, stay in the house, mark the window. If any of those conditions aren't met, you die and it's not on us. What I love is go down to the end of the story. Um, verse 20, if you tell this business of ours, then we're free from the oath. Okay? If you tell on us, we're free from that. But if you don't and you follow through, then we are bound to this. And she said, according to your words, so be it. So she sent them away. They departed. They, she tied the scarlet cord in the window. And they departed and came to the hill country and remained there three days until the pursuers were gone. Now the pursuers had sought them all along the road, but had not found them. Then two men returned and came down from the hill country and crossed over and came to Joshua, son of Nun. And they related to him all that had happened. And they said to Joshua, surely the Lord has given all the land into our hands. Moreover, all the inhabitants of the land shall be melted away before us. Look at the outcome. The outcome is he sends these men and at the outcome they come back and they share with him that God is about to do something in us. Why? What's the confidence that they gain from this? Here's what I want you to understand. When you talk about the theory of lost people, they're scarier than if you get to know them. Once you get to know them, you'll find out that, you know, people say, oh, Islam, it's so hard to reach them for the gospel. That's because they don't know Muslims. I know a lot of Muslims. A lot of them are desperately searching people. It's not as galvanizing as the news makes it sound. When you don't know anybody, all you see are Canaanites. <laughs> when you know them, you go, listen, when, you, when we actually got talking to them, they're scared to death of us. They, they, actually, they actually think God is at work in us. Here's the thing. If you'll get to know the people that you're trying to reach, you're going to find, I don't mean get to know to compromise, I mean get to know to bring God's message to them. Here's what you're going to find out. You're going to find out that they're not as tough as it looks. Everybody looks tough when you don't know who they are. Did anybody ever tell you you looked mean? Here's the thing. When you don't know somebody, you make up a narrative in your mind. So what I love about this story is by the end of the story, not only have they won a new friend in Jericho, not only have they gotten the reconnaissance they need, but they got encouragement into the ears of Joshua. You wouldn't believe what the news of us is. God has done great things in us, and they're scared to death of us. Chapter 3, if I had a title for it, is very simple. The crossing. It is the big moment. Israel has waited. They have now come to the edge. Moses is gone. Joshua is leading. And it says in chapter 3, now bolstered by the news that they are quaking, I say, quaking in Jericho. They are worried. By the way, there's going to be another story that's very much like this in the Gideon story. When we get to Judges, Gideon is a mess until all of a sudden, like, they end up, they end up going into the camp of the enemy, and the enemy says, oh, we're all going to die. And then he goes back, and he's like, oh, built up. Okay, so I want you to put Joshua on the front side of being built up. He's stoked. Verses 1 through 4 of chapter 3, God goes first. Three words, God goes first. What do I mean? Joshua rose early in the morning 
and he and all the sons of Israel set out from Shittim. Shittim is the word for an acacia tree. Um, Shittim is the, is the name of a tree. And came to Jordan. And um, it's also the name of a place. I, I didn't mean to say they were all standing under a tree, okay? Um, but it's also the name of a place. And they came to Jordan and lodged there before they crossed. And at the end of three days, the officers went through the midst of the camp and commanded the people saying, saying, uh, when you see the ark and the covenant of the Lord your God with all the Levitical priests carrying it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Now, if this were an American tale, it'd be like they're entering the land. They're already in it. Remember that it's Westerners that divide territories at rivers. Middle Easterners divide them at mountains. Both sides of the river, the same ecosystem. So it's not like now they're coming into the land. Why aren't the people coming out to get them? Because they've been in the land for a while. They're too big to get. If the people of Jericho could have hit them last night, they'd already done it. They weren't ready to do that. The only thing the people of Jericho could do was huddle inside the wall and hope for the best. What was going on back, meanwhile, back in Jericho during these verses, people are running in as much as they can of storage of food and water inside Jericho because they're coming, and when they come, the only way we're going to survive it is close up the gate and hang on for the siege. That's what they're hoping. They're hoping that these desert folk don't have siege weapons and that they can't uh, besiege this big, big uh, mud brick and stone wall. And so it says then, he says, when you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God with the Levitical priest carrying it, and you'll set out from the place and go after it. However, there shall be between you and a, a, at a distance of, say, 3,000 feet, 2,000 cubits by measure. Do not come near it. For you may, you do, you may that, that you may know the way by which you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. You're supposed to smile. We're going someplace new. They go first. You stay back. Why? Because you don't know where you're going. Okay? Then when it's time, go wherever they go. But look at what's happening. You're sending a bunch of unarmed Levites to go walking out with the Ark of the Covenant in front of the army. God goes first. And the protection of Israel was not its army. The protection of Israel was that God had an Ark and that God said, put the Ark in the midst of the tabernacle and wherever you go, I go with you. The presence of God was their protection and the Ark was a symbol of it. I guarantee you that on both sides, people stood back in awe when they saw the ark. You know why? The Israelites hadn't seen it for a long time. When it was carried, it was carried covered. When it was inside the Holy of Holies, they didn't see it. They remember it from when it was built, but it's been a generation since then. Let me just show you something. Go to chapter 5, verse 5 for a second. There's an interesting note. It says... All the people who came out were circumcised, but all the people who were born in the wilderness along the way uh, as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. What I want you to understand is for a long time, people have been being born. They're now 40 years old, and they've never been circumcised. They don't know everything that happened in the beginning of the journey. The number of people that were there when God divided the, the Red Sea, most of these were people not even born yet. This is a whole new generation. Now, some people from the old group were there, but very, very few. And so what I'm saying to you is as they come through, he says, now look, stand back. We're going to walk God out. And they're watching this ark go out. And they're watching it go to the river. Now, they don't cross the river yet. Look at verse 5. Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Notice that what he does is God goes first and preparation goes before. Not only does God go in front of the people, but people have to prepare themselves for what God is about to do. He gives the people a sense of anticipation. Tomorrow, you're not going to believe what God is going to do. It's going to be wonderful. Now get ready. Get clean. If you've ever scrubbed in your life, you're going to scrub that night. Because you're counting on a victory that comes in part as a result of your obedience. You have heard 
me from this place standing here going on and on and on if you obey if you obey if you obey if you don't squash so they're going to obey and they're going to get exacting now it says in verse 6 Joshua spoke to the priests saying take up the ark of the covenant cross over the pe uh, over ahead of the people so they took up the ark of the covenant and went ahead of the people now the Lord said to Joshua this day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel that they may know that just as I has been with Moses, I will be with you. How? How is he going to do that? God says, as I was with Moses, so I shall be with you, Joshua. And the way he does it is he says, do you remember Moses got started with a really cool water crossing? Well, yours is going to be a little smaller than that one, but I'm going to do it again. So there's a, there's a uh, Riverbed 2, the sequel. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, it's not as cool as the first one, I admit, but it's, it's what we got. Now remember, the Jordan River is only half the width of this room at flood stage. You can toss a rock underhand across the Jordan. So any of you who come from any place that have a real river will laugh when you see the Jordan. You will go, and I will say, and now the mighty Jordan, and you'll see this little stream and you'll go, but these people have been in the desert for 40 years. And the only river in the desert is a flash flood and it kills people. And they're scared to death of it. And if you're scared of bees, they don't have to be the size of buses. They just have to be that big to terrify you. So they look at this river and they think, we're all going to die because they haven't done river. I want you to imagine that you've lived in a desert and in your whole life you've never been in a bathtub. That's what Bedouin you drive through the Sinai Desert, that's their experience. They've never been in a shower, they've never been in a bath. They've seen the beach, but they don't go in the water. And if you don't have a boat, and honestly they're scared to death of water. So I want you to put them standing there. Now watch what happens. You shall moreover, verse 8, command the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, when you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. So it says, walk down into the water and then stand there. Okay. I'm thinking Levites are gone. I sure hope he knows what he's doing. And they're standing in the water and they're thinking, we're going to be swept away any moment. We're all going to die. You okay, Ed? I'm still here, Joe. Yeah, I hope he knows what he's doing. Now they're standing there. They're standing there knee deep in water, holding a very heavy golden ark. Then Joshua said to the sons of Israel, come here, hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, by this you shall know the living God is among you that he will assuredly dispossess the Canaanite, Hittite, Hevite, Perizzite, Girgashite, Amorite, Jebusite. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over ahead of you into the, jo into the Jordan. Now then, take for yourselves 12 men from the 12 tribes of Israel, one for each tribe. It shall come about when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan will be cut off and the waters which are flowing down from above will stand in one heap. He says they're going to walk in and God's going to shut the water off and dry it up. And some of, the, some of the older ones are going, hey, we've seen this before. Where do you see this? You know, the young ones are going, why is it going to dry up the water? Yeah, 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 we did this before. You should have seen it. It was very cool. And now it says... So when, and notice, underline when, when the people set out from their tents to cross the Jordan with the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant before the, the people, and when, underline when, those who carried the Ark came into the Jordan and the feet of the priests carrying the Ark were dipped into the edge of the water for the Jordan overflows all its banks all the days of harvest. I'll come back and tell you why he told you that in a minute. The waters which were flowing down from above and rose up, rose up in one heap at a great distance away at Adam. What does that look like, that word? Adam, okay, remember Adam. Adam is the name of the man. Adom is red. Adma is dirt because dirt is red in that part of the world. This is the mud flats. 
Now, the reason he's telling you this, I don't believe anybody went running up a couple of hours to go up and see where the water stopped. The point is that little parentheses in the narrative, that's where the water always stopped. Every year, the mudslides would block up the water. So the miracle here is not that the water of the Jordan never got cut off. It got cut off every year. It's that it happened that day at that time corresponding with that thing. The people later on when they got to know the land knew how God did it. That didn't stop it from being a miracle. Just because you know how God did it didn't mean that God didn't do it. So the timing and the intensity of the miracle was that day on that side of the uh, of the world, God cut off that river. And he tells you in there, by the way, the, blank, the Jordan never flows its banks every time at the year. You know. So he's telling you, later on we figured it out. But right now, it was so cool. We walked out there and stood there. And then all of a sudden, the water stopped coming. And all the people of Israel went, oh, da, 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 the water stopped coming. Oh, da, da. Great is Joshua. God is on our side. Ah, da, da. Now, Here's the thing. What they're admitting is that though it happened every year, God timed it for them because that was their first experience and that's what they needed. God gave them the sign they needed. I mean, I've seen people come to Christ because they found their car keys. Whatever sign you need is the one God can give you. And so here's a sign that's, by the way, a common thing. But it's a common thing timed for the right moment. Now it says this. The city is beside Zarath, uh, Zarathon. That's just to tell you where Adma is. And those who were flowing down toward the Sea of Araval, the Salt Sea, that's the Dead Sea, were completely cut off. So the people crossed opposite Jericho. And the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan while all Israel crossed on dry ground until all the nation had, had finished crossing the Jordan. So we've come into the land and the first 13 verses are preparation to come in and from verses 14 to 17, it's the actual crossing ceremony. And what is the point of the passage? Tell me, class. So you, I just told you the story that took me 14 verses to tell you how to get prepared and another three verses to tell me what happened when they walked across and God stopped the water. What's the whole point of the story? The last part of everything we read in Deuteronomy was shutting down. Old people dying off. Moses giving up. It was all about kind of the end of an era. This is the beginning of a new one. This is the moment when God puts it on Joshua. New leader, new conditions, new work, new excitement, new things happening. And what I want you to understand is when you start to see this unfold, right away, first of all, by chapter 6, Joshua's going to want to resign. I'm almost certain, okay? Because it looks easier than it really is. Second, I think the people start off with God emotionally strengthening them. Don't discount that God knows you need more than just a knowledge of the scripture. You're going to need some emotional bolstering to do what he asks you to do. It's going to take some heart. And, and there's something very cool about this story because God massages the hearts of people that have been sort of parched by the wilderness and he does it by stopping a river. He makes it dry so that they can be <laughs> kind of excited anew. It's, it's weird because you think, what do they need more dry for? They've been doing dry for so long. But God met them at the point of their fear. And he met them to, to reignite an excitement. And there's a, there's a beautiful story here. Now, the very next thing that has to happen, and we're almost done for the day, the very next thing that has to happen in the beginning of chapter 4 is there has to be a memory of this. When God moves and the new thing gets started, somebody took a picture of the before. Did you ever do a project and think, man, if I would have taken a picture of this before I did it, I am notorious for after-only pictures. I have no before pictures. <clears throat> there aren't some exceptions. I did take a picture when I was rewiring the kitchen of the wall before I installed the wall so I could remember where the wires were when I went to hang the cabinets later. But that's a rarity. Usually I forget to do these things. Look at this. It says, when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, don't make this a different chapter. It's the same story. The Lord spoke to Joshua again. And by the way, characteristically through the book, you want to do a cool study? Just look for Lord spoke to Joshua. Look at the number of times God speaks to Josh. Because by now, Joshua knows his voice. He's been at this a long time. 
And, and the Lord spoke to Joshua and said, take for yourselves 12 men from the people, one from each tribe, and command them, saying, take up for yourselves 12 stones out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. He says, while the river stopped up, before the priests moved on, he went back and he said, I forgot to tell you something. Right at that moment, Josh said, stop, everybody, stop. You 12, pick up 12 stones. And they're running out to where the priests were and they pick up these stones and then everybody comes over and they've got these stones. And they're told, take those stones and put them in the camp where we're camping tonight. Verse, tw uh, verse 4. Joshua called the 12 men whom he had appointed for the sons of Israel, one from each tribe. Joshua said to them, cross again to the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Take each one, take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Let this be a sign among you so that when your children ask later saying, what did these stones mean? You shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan uh, were cut off. So these stones will become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. He said, not only do I want you to experience what I want you to experience, I want you to take a picture of it. I want you to have a memorial for it. Because later on, your kids are going to be here. Why is a memorial important? Because it's psychological. What does it do for the people? By the way, your kids are going to grow up in this land. They're going to be back here. This is going to be a tourist attraction. Verse 8, thus the sons of Israel did as Joshua commanded and took up the stones from the middle of the Jordan, just as the Lord spoke to Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel, and they carried them over with them to the lodging place and put them there. Now Joshua set up the 12 stones in the middle of the, uh, of the Jordan at the place where the feet of the priests who had carried the, the Ark of the Covenant were standing, and they were there to this day. So there used to be a crossing place at the Jordan where you could look back and see where the, so originally that night they brought all the stones back and later Joshua removes the stones and sets them up one on top of another to make this kind of crossing point so that in generations to pass by they can look back and see these 12 stones. And then he just describes for you the priests carrying the ark in verses, verse 10 <coughs> and it says that um, verse 12 the sons of Reuben, sons of Gad, half tribe of Manasseh crossed uh, 40,000 equipped for war. So they did what they were told to do. They came with their brothers and they decided that they would fight with them. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all of Israel so that they revered him just as they had revered Moses all the days of his life. And that's the close of that story. The close of the story is, and Joshua was now really the leader.